Hello and welcome on in, everybody. Uh, my name is Sam Peterson. I'm going to be your host today, and I am here with our guest, Maddie Belwar. Maddie, how are you doing? I'm doing great, thanks. How are you? I'm good, thanks. Thanks so much for joining us. And uh, yeah, Happy to be here. <laughs> before we get going, I just want to remind everyone, we do have the Photoshop challenges with Voodoo Val. So definitely check those out if you haven't. This is week two of two. And each day we do a different challenge at 9 a.m. Pacific time. You can join the community discord. That's where you'll be able to share your challenges, get feedback. So definitely check that out. We have a whole challenge page where you can see all of those. And uh, I just want to say to hey it to everyone in chat. Um, Annika Armada is here. What's going on, Annika? Good to see you. We have Steve, Oliver, uh, Robert, Jimmy, Clever, Bruce, the whole gang's here. What's up, everybody? Um, I also wanted to give a quick little heads up to anyone watching over on YouTube. The main chat is over here on Behance, so we'll be checking this out here. Uh, it's going to be the easiest way to see your questions or comments or anything like that. So definitely consider jumping over here and joining us. Um, and I just wanted to say hey to Maddie. And uh, Maddie, why don't you introduce yourself for anyone who's not familiar with your work and tell us a little bit about what you'll be working on today. Sure. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining. Um, I'm going to share a little bit of my art, if you're not familiar. Um, I'm a digital and traditional painter. I absolutely love landscapes and environments. That is probably what you'll see most from me. I enjoy painting people as well, but um, I love green, lush environment scenes. Um, let me make this a little bigger. Lots of different shades of green, dappled lighting. Um, those are the things that inspire me most, uh, landscapes in general, honestly, but the colors, light and texture. And I want to show you real quick also some of my um, my traditional work. Um, it's gouache and watercolor mainly that I work in. So um, but a lot of the same type of subject matter with uh, a lot of green plants and um, just happy scenes uh, in nature, basically. Yeah, I love I love the aesthetic you have going for your uh your Instagram, it looks very cohesive. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Appreciate it. I like whimsical, like fantasy, things like that. Um, yeah, every once in a while I paint something moody, but usually uh, a lot of happy lighting is what you'll see in my art. Do you do like 50-50 between traditional and digital or is it kind of one more than the other? It, it's usually 50 50 every once in a while for a short time i'll kind of sway more one way or the other but it's usually pretty even yeah oh that's cool i feel like that's really hard for me to keep up any balance i always just kind of jump all into one yeah i was like that too for a long time and then um i, I don't know i got into more of a balance over the last year or so but I, I definitely there was a period of time where i only did digital art for like five years so it felt good to get back into traditional again too yeah, that's fun. I feel like that keeps it pretty fresh. Definitely. So what are you working on today? So today I want to do an illustration. Um, the kind of feeling that I want to capture is like setting off on a big adventure. And I have um, some references that I compiled here that I wanted to share with you guys and also maybe get some uh, chat input. Um, the idea was I want a character standing on top of a grassy hill, maybe some wildflowers, big puffy clouds. Um, and then for the character, I have a couple few different options here. And uh, maybe I can write like A, B, C, something like that. Um, if chat wanted to give some opinions. So we have um, a woman in a red dress here, which I think might be a nice like pop of color against sort of a green blue background. And then um, we have this lady wearing a hat and uh, having a suitcase with her and then a little girl with a basket of flowers. So I liked all these ideas um, and I wanted to know what chat thought <laughs> about them. Yeah, chat, definitely let us know if you have a preference here, put it in the chat, um, which one you think uh, Maddie should go with. Yeah, also, we can definitely. Oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, no, go ahead. Oh, uh, we can take bits and pieces too, like um, like the color thing. Uh, I think, you know, we can mix up little pieces of these, but just the, the general idea. Um, yeah, I would definitely like to know what you guys think. Do you usually kind of create a, a mood board or references to choose from before starting a piece? Yes, I usually do. Um, oftentimes, if I'm just doing like a study or something like that, I'll just grab one image and do a painting of that. But if I'm doing a personal work, usually I'll get the idea first and then I'll go search for images 
to um, to support that, you know, reference images that I can use to help guide me in painting the background or the characters or whatnot. And then, yeah, so I'll compile something like this and then paint from that. Oh, okay. And also just uh, heads up to chat, Annika put a poll in the chat. So if you want to vote on there, we can kind of see what everyone's thinking. I'll keep that up here. Thank you, Annika. Got. Yeah, thanks, Annika. <laughs> Yeah, we'll go vote. We'll give you guys a couple of minutes to check that out, see what people are feeling and uh, go from there. It looks like right now we actually have some votes in already. A woman in red dress with hat is seven votes. Um, a woman with suitcase is second. It's coming coming up. It's at five votes. <laughs> so those are the two popular ones right now. Okay, okay, cool. So I, I won't like... say my preference. I don't want to influence. <laughs> Yeah, it looks like that's uh, A and B are the most okay. popular so far. Cool. Good choices. <laughs> yeah, I definitely need to start doing a little bit more prep work. That was actually kind of a, something I was trying to commit to is when I do pieces, actually prepare it and plan it and, you know, get references after you get yeah. the initial idea. Because sometimes I think I just want to rush through them, but it really helps to, to kind of have a, a foundation when you're starting. It does. It does. Like when you have that inspiration, sometimes you just want to like start. <laughs> so I understand that too. Okay. It looks like um, Annika made a second poll with the A, B, and C. Maybe we can kind of pick between. It seems like okay. either way, A is the most popular. The um, woman in red dress awesome. with the hat. So it looks like it's 11 to 7. I think we got a pretty okay. good lead with the... Uh, red dress cool all right well i liked all of the options but uh that was my favorite too so okay. i'm glad you guys picked it <laughs> perfect <laughs> yay okay so yeah one of the things i wanted to talk uh about today was the idea of um using multiple reference pictures to create like one new image and sort of how to think about that because it can be a little complicated um one thing that you want to pay attention to is the lighting that sometimes the lighting can be really different in the different images. So you kind of have to think about when you're painting your version of the image to kind of choose one of the lighting scenarios and go with that one, because otherwise you can have like mixed match lighting and things like that. So we'll think about that. Um, I'll move my references over to the other monitor. And we can get started. I want to do a vertical composition for this because I think um, I want to do these big puffy clouds behind uh, the character. So that's what led me to chose, um, yeah, portrait style instead of landscape style composition. Do you ever collage images together, references together beforehand, or do you just kind of use it off to the side to look at? I used to do that. I used to do that. And I, it ended up, I, it took a lot of time to actually collage them. And sometimes I felt too restricted by then having to paint exactly what I had collaged. So I feel like leaving them separate, I feel a little bit more um, freedom, I guess, to just kind of mentally take some things here and there, but not like drawing the exact collage that I made, if that makes sense. Yeah, that totally makes sense. Kind of allows you to interpret it a little bit more how you want. Exactly. So I usually start with the horizon line or something like that when I, um, I feel like the top of this hill is kind of serving as our horizon. It's a little bit, I want to have like a little bit of a perspective, like what we saw in the um, reference image, this one here where you're kind of looking from below. I think it's got an epic feeling to it. So something like that. And then maybe the maybe the little girl, I'm trying to decide if she should be standing like here or maybe more, a little bit more to the side. Like a lot of times when I'm trying to come up with my composition, um, I use this uh, lay guide layout. So the um, view, um, guides, new guide layout, and I'll do the, three columns, three rows for a rule of thirds grid. So it might be nice to like put her on this bottom third axis as a focal area. And then we can kind of bring up some big puffy clouds behind her. And maybe some little grassy things. We kind of want to have everything leading towards the focal point. So our character is going to be our focal point. And maybe we can have like some some rocks or like even a path or yeah some flowers. Um, we can do whatever we want here, but I kind of want to think about like leading the eye towards her. Now, do you always start out with a sketch, or do you ever kind of block in colors and shapes first? I almost always use a sketch, but every once in a while, if I'm just like having a day where my sketch is the, it does not working, then I'll switch over and start blocking things in. But I sketch maybe like ninety percent of the time. 
but they're very loose, as you can see. Yeah, no, I mean, that definitely gives you the idea. I find I haven't done landscapes a lot, but I have found that like just getting a general looseness of the shapes helps so much. Yeah, exactly. And it just just the almost like the outline of the shapes rather than I try not to get into too much detail, but it really does help. So I'm just going to put the um, sketch on a low opacity on multiply mode so I can kind of see through it easily and start putting some colors in here. So I try to uh, block in like the basic shapes and colors first. So oftentimes uh, my paintings look like super, um, yeah, just almost like like a little uh, kid artwork like at the beginning. It'll just be like the most basic shapes and then um, adding textures and details on top of that. But that really helps um, me to figure out like the composition and how everything's working together color wise. So I try to like avoid getting into um, details really soon. No, I think that's a great idea. That's like one of my biggest tips. I mean, for other people, my, but myself too, is to try to block out all the colors and values as roughly as you can, just so you can get an idea of how the entire piece is going to look. Because sometimes yeah. when you uh, detail one area, you'll you'll start getting into the whole thing later and it looks weird or out of context or something like that. Exactly. Also just wanted to say, hey, to some new people in the chat. I see Wade in the chat, uh, Mirko and Laura. <laughs> welcome on in everybody. Hi everybody. Jimmy says my paintings always look like little kid artwork. <laughs> it's the first stage I think <laughs> that we all try to get out of. So right now, for example, I'm like so tempted to keep painting the grass because I, you just get into a flow and it's like nice to keep going. But I'm like, no, Maddie, paint the clouds, <laughs> block in the clouds first. Don't do any details. You know, for as much as I love clouds, like anytime I see cool clouds in the sky, I'm always captivate, captivated by it or like cool sunsets. But I never paint skies and clouds. And I love paintings when I see them. Like there's so much. Yeah. I think anything organic I really enjoy. And so you think clouds would be like the perfect thing, but I gotta, I gotta do it more. I think it's just because I don't really do landscapes. Yeah, definitely. There, it's, I feel like cloud painting can take a while, I guess. Like when you, when I paint clouds, I feel like I have to spend a decent amount of time on them before I feel like they look good. It's just you get, layering all these little soft and hard edges and they can be so complicated. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's a, there's so much interest that can happen with them. Mm -hmm. Do you have a favorite place to get references? Because I know in the past I've struggled to find good landscape references. And I know certain um, certain sites seem to be better than others. But do you have a go-to one? Um, probably at this point, I, I use Unsplash a lot. And I also take a lot of my own photos these days. Like I, I like to go for walks and things um, just to like as sort of as relaxation and um, spending some time outside in fresh air and stuff. And there's a few nature parks around where I live and I take tons of photos. And a lot of my paintings, especially my traditional art paintings come from uh, my own photos that I've taken. I was wondering about that because I saw you have a reference pack on your Behance. Yes, yes, that's right. So I recently went on a trip and I took a lot of photos there. Um, oh my gosh, it was so amazing. We went to, um, Black Forest National Park in Germany and I took lots of photos in the forest there and it was it was really beautiful. Yeah that's cool. Is photography something you you've been doing for some time as well or is it just something you did to to supplement your artwork for references? The second one. Okay. <laughs> yeah I got into it specifically for um yeah, for references. And I've de I definitely enjoy it. Um, but I, I usually take the pictures with my phone and it's nothing very advanced. It's just for reference. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. good to have. It's kind of nice to be able to capture those things when you see them and remember them and go back to them later. Yeah, exactly. I feel like it really helps um, when you have that combination of a photo you've taken, but of a place you've been, because the photo will kind of remind you of what it looked like when you were there. Um, but you you also have that memory because sometimes the camera doesn't pick up everything. So when you combine the photo with your own memory, then you can kind of fill in those 
missing pieces. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. I, f- I found that like whenever I look back on photos of trips, I'll, I wouldn't have remembered that, but I was like, oh yeah. And that it was the whole place and it had that cool thing and the lighting exactly. was like this. So that's a, that's a good point. Um, so I like to flip my canvas a lot to give me a fresh uh, look at things. This is great for um, portraits and environments, but it really helps me to see if something's going wonky. Yeah, that's uh, also a very, very solid tip. Flip your canvas. Do you have that hotkey? I do. I set it to control F for flip. So it's just like easy to remember. Okay. Mine's uh, I set to control T, which is very close to nice. that. Yeah. Yeah, it's nice to have as a shortcut, definitely. I often like to pair my hotkeys close to each other. So I have like a uh, grayscale check hotkey that's control Y. So flip and grayscale oh, yeah. check are right next to each other. I oh, have you that got one it too. too. Nice. Yeah, control Y is so great. And it's it's good that you brought that up because I should be checking that <laughs> um, very often while I'm painting. I try to remember. Sometimes I go sort of autopilot for a while and then I'm like, oh, I need to look at my values. Yeah. Um, do you remember how to set that up for anyone yeah. in chat who might be wondering? Definitely. Um, so what you want to do is go to view proof setup and then custom. So yeah, once again, view proof setup custom and then click on that. And then the only thing you have to do here is under the um, proof conditions, the device to simulate, you want to select working gray dot gain 20%. It's a big drop down. Um, but yeah, <laughs> working gray dot gain 20% and then you click OK. And then after that, every time you press control Y, it'll um, take you into that black and white value view and then control Y again and it'll bring you back. Yeah. And what's great about that is you can actually paint in the uh, grayscale view mode because it's not actually changing your canvas. So it's just changing the view. So if anyone hasn't used that before, it's a really flexible uh, system it to work is. with. It's so cool because sometimes if you ever get really stuck in a painting and you want to paint in the black and white mode, you can do that and you can keep painting like that for a little bit. Yeah, for sure. That's uh, I occasionally do that if my values are not quite where they're supposed to be and I can't <laughs> yeah. figure out why. All right, so I'm going to add the character in and I'm going to start with a hard round brush and just kind of go pretty bold with this. Um, I want to make sure that we just get a good shape for her because she's going to be so small uh, compared to the rest of the composition um, that I just want to make sure that she reads well. Um, so just the shape of the dress, maybe it could be blowing in the wind a little bit. I think that could be cool. And her upper body. And maybe she can be, yeah, she can be holding her hat like in the reference. Um, I find this part can be really tricky. Painting um, characters in the environment and just getting them right with like scale and everything. Sometimes it takes a little bit of transforming and <laughs> tools and things, but. And also just graphically, like trying to simplify a small figure is is tricky. Yeah, this is only something that I've kind of uh, because I, I, I love landscapes and I've been painting environments for a while and just recently I've started to get a little bit more interested in, you know, the storytelling aspect, adding characters to the scene and getting to that next level of yeah, adding a new thing into the mix with the character. Mm -hmm. Also, hey to uh, Umicorn, RB, Biola, anyone who's hey. just popped in chat, welcome on in everybody. Welcome everybody. And she's got her hat up there. Let's get the base colors. And then uh, maybe maybe we'll go with uh, some hair flowing. And I usually do a lot of canvas flipping when I'm in this stage where I'm kind of like trying to figure stuff out and I can't tell if it's working or not. Yeah, flipping early is definitely a good habit to have because if you get like 50% through the <laughs> painting and you flip for the first time and you're like, no. Yeah. Oh, that's bad. That's a bad feeling when it happens because that's definitely yeah. happened to me. I try to flip just like even when I'm doing this super rough sketch of like a character or something, you know, before I even get anything solidified. So that mm -hmm. we can avoid any surprises. What um, amount of your paintings would you say you fit characters into your environments? Do you do a lot of just like plain environments or is it usually some sort of character? 
it's usually just environments. Um, yeah, I'm not sure percentage wise, very low. This is, I've only recently, um, I posted one on my Instagram that had uh, two girls like sort of dancing in a, um, in a big open field with flowers around them and stuff. But yeah, I, I usually, I haven't done too much of it. I've done a lot of, you know, I've done character work and I've done environments, but I'm just mm -hmm. now um, enjoying the process of putting them together. Yeah, that's kind of something I've wanted to do uh, more as well, fitting like larger environments um, behind my characters. Yeah, definitely. Well, the nice thing is we have all these um, transform tools because, <laughs> you know, as someone who does traditional and digital. Um, I love both mediums, but I really appreciate when I work in Photoshop and I can just move things around easily and I don't have to repaint them. So we can turn her around, resize things, all that good stuff. Now, are you keeping all these on different layers, the character, foreground, cloud, sky, etc.? Yes, let's, here, I'll show you what layers I have so far. So we have this one where I've made a random paint stroke down here, but yeah, it's the sky and then we have the clouds and the grass and then her. And it's just based on what I think is easiest to have like layered kind of going into the distance. Yeah, I think uh, separating those really makes life easier, especially when you need, need to make edits. Yeah, it definitely does. I usually, I, I actually like to merge a lot, but only when I get to a certain point in the painting process, like in this early stage where we're still changing things so much, I, I definitely like that these are separate layers. I think uh, Yeevee in chat was asking why, why flip or why flipping works. Do you have any thoughts on the why exactly you flip? So from what, how I understand this um, is that it, it basically, causes your brain to like reprocess the image because you've been looking at it the same way for a long time and it's almost like you you don't see it anymore or something you're just I don't know you're kind of you, you sort of get um blind to the mistake somehow and when you when you flip it then you get a fresh look at it and I don't know exactly why the science behind why that is but it, it definitely seems to be true yeah yeah I think um it's kind of the thing I think maybe we have a tendency to skew things one way just without noticing and when you flip it it's the opposite extreme so I think it just stands out even more to you so if you're shifting the eyes over to the right and you flip it to the left now it's not even it's past the center point but it's all the way to the left so I think mm -hmm. it's a little bit more glaringly obvious for us also hey to Mikey in the chat what's going on Mikey good to see you hi Mikey Mikey says, at some point you go from making an environment to frame a ca the character to placing the character within an environment. I think, uh, yeah, I think it's usually one way or the other for a lot of people. You're fitting characters in your environment or you're trying to give your characters yeah. an environment and trying <laughs> to do the second more. Yeah, that's true. I think they complement each other so much, though, because you'll have an environment and it's really cool. But as soon as you put a, a character into it, you know, there's kind of like life there. There's maybe yes. an implied story like is this a human character or is this like another world mm -hmm. and then same thing with a character it's like you're giving them context for like the type of area they exist in so i think they just um add a whole nother element of potential narrative yeah i totally agree and, and i think for the viewer it's like they can um at least sometimes it seems like it gives you the chance to Put yourself in the place of the person in the painting like in a situation like this it's kind of like that you're getting the feeling of like going off on a big adventure the feeling of standing there is somehow put forward to the viewer a little bit more than if you just see the picture of the environment yeah and just like a sense of scale too i, I feel like that's yeah. why i see so many characters in environment paintings is just to show like how vast or you know how huge that's true. the area is so. That's so true. You have the little tiny person and you're like, whoa. <laughs> yeah. I guess there's a few things you could probably do for a sense of scale, maybe trees, but I guess trees can be varying scales. So mm -hmm. hum humans are a, a good way to see that. Yeah, they are. Jennifer says, I feel so awful. I haven't been drawing in months. I've been obsessed with photography. I mean, I think whatever creative outlet you're kind of feeling at the moment, I say go with it because, uh, motivation can be fleeting so you know take it while you got it 
So true. You gotta follow your inspiration. And all of the stuff that you would learn in photography, like that's all gonna be in involved in your painting or whatever your other mediums are. Like there's so much overlap in the knowledge, like it's still beneficial. Definitely like color and composition and lighting and mm -hmm. all those things play into it. I actually just started getting into photography for the first time, like ever. Um, really? And I, yeah, and I do find that there's, you know, there's some overlap for sure. Absolutely. Because like all your aesthetic preferences are, you know, can still be present in the photo. You know, like, yeah. oh, I, li I like contrast. I like muted colors. I like focusing on this type of subject matter. So I think they definitely complement each other. Yeah, I think so too. I was looking at some um, reference pictures, uh, some photos that I had taken to use as reference like a couple of years ago. And I was like, wow, I was, I was kind of happy on one hand to see that like, I think my my ability to see compositions has improved because I was like looking at them, I was like, wow, some of these are, I don't know, not to my taste anymore. <laughs> so I feel like my eye for composition has improved. And I think taking photos really helped with that. I think that was a great um, practice, yeah. honestly. I can see that. Yeah. Annika says this has come together really quickly. I think that's the power of focusing on big shapes for sure and uh, yeah. strong composition. Thank you. Actually, let's take a look at the composition because um, we're still in such an early stage. We can make a lot of changes. Um, I think I'm happy with it overall, but there's a little bit of a, of a balance thing to me. I feel like we need something more over here, maybe on the right, like either like more cloud or maybe a little cloud over here. I don't know. Sometimes you just have to try, try stuff and see how it looks. Mm -hmm. But I feel like this cloud is maybe too squished to the side. So I'm either going to move it or I'm going to add a little bit more to the composition and just kind of extend the canvas. I think I might, I might try that. Yeah. And on the topic of a uh, composition chat, you can probably see how like the cloud, even though it's this one large shape, there's like sub shapes made up in it with the lighting, like on the top left of the cloud is the biggest area of light. And then we have that little pocket of light within the shadow. So it kind of creates this like primary, secondary and tertiary shape. So that's a uh, kind of have like shapes within shapes, you know, the secondary ones that are a big part of composition too. That's right. Something that's really hard for me is with shapes, not accidentally making them all the same over and over again. Like yeah. having different size shape, uh, size shapes is so important and it makes your composition so much more interesting. Like here, for example, these two bumps are like kind of roughly the same size. So it might be more interesting if I like make this one smaller and make the bottom one a little larger, just break it up more. So it's not same, same. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I always... I guess that's something I think about a lot, which is the like the one, two, three read or the big, medium, small, where you're trying yeah. to vary the sizes between like three different things. Tim says it's all about the light. I agree. So um, true. Bruce was asking, how does Maddie stay motivated to paint? Ooh. <laughs> um. I think I'm lucky in the sense that I just love painting so much that most of the time I, I want to do it. And there's a key, occasionally when I get into a little bit of a rut or an art block or something like that, um, that can happen. And usually I just watch videos, watch streams, you know, of other people painting or watch some tutorials or things like that. And um, try to maybe learn a new technique or something because usually that gets me wanting to paint again if I'm having that problem. Yeah, definitely. I think one of the biggest things for me is what you mentioned where just being in an environment where people are painting or watching people paint. Like if I'm watching YouTube videos on painting and drawing, I'm gonna wanna paint and draw. But if I'm watching um, YouTube videos on like fitness stuff, I'm gonna go wanna work out. Yeah. Like that, that motivated me to work out now. And it's like whatever subject matter I'm watching photos on or photos of videos on, I kind of get into that mindset. So yeah, I think if you surround yourself like with communities online and videos yes. and whatever you're consuming, that's kind of on that subject that might, you know, give you a lot of ideas and inspiration. I totally agree. The community thing is really big. Having, having art friends and people to hang out with. Mm -hmm, for sure.
I also think habit is just a huge thing because if you've never done anything before, I can go back to saying like the gym thing, if you don't go to the gym ever, or if you never draw or paint, doing that every day can seem really daunting. But if you get in a habit where you've been doing it 20 or 30 days consistently, it just kind of becomes part of what you do. You don't really think about it as much. So that's true. I think that makes things a lot easier as well. So I just wanted to mention, um, I am doing like a little cloud painting technique right now that I find really, really fun. So if anyone's ever stuck painting clouds, um, one thing that I would suggest is um, taking a textured brush for your paintbrush and for your eraser and just kind of painting in and then just erasing out with a textured brush and just kind of seeing whatever weird wispy things just nat naturally happen because a lot of times the happy accidents can work really well in clouds since they're all crazy shapes anyway. Yeah, I love that those brush strokes you're making, like it's kind of those wispy clouds. Yeah. Were you, were you smudging it before? Is that a technique you use for clouds? It is. I tried smudging and I felt like it was a bit, it was a bit heavy handed, but I think I will probably do some of that in this big cloud. Um, I really love when clouds kind of have an edge that just dissolves completely. And they and it gets really soft. Yeah, that looks cool. Yeah, I think that's so nice. So I just have a smudge, uh, like a basic smudge tool, and just kind of randomly smudge a little bit here and there. On the topic of inspiration that we were just talking about, I see now I want to go paint some some uh, smudgy soft clouds. <laughs> yes. Maybe I'll finally pull myself to do a cloud painting after this stream. Oh, do it! That would be awesome. I feel like you'd be great at cloud painting, like that your rendering style. I, I think it would be awesome. Yeah, I think it's one of those things that I would really just enjoy painting because there's so much like organic form and I, I really like the softness. So I'd be able to do my kind of brush stroke mm -hmm. smudge technique a lot. It seems like it's right up my alley. I just yeah. haven't really tried it. And there's so much diversity with clouds, like different times of day, they look totally different. The lighting sunset clouds are awesome. You know, moody clouds, oh, the weather conditions, just it, it, you could paint clouds forever and there's always something different. Yeah, definitely. Steve says cloud study would be as key as anatomy for scenes like this, for sure. <laughs> I, I've definitely known um, painters who like clouds are like the pull for that, uh, that painting, the focus. Yeah. There's so much cool lighting you can do with clouds. It's so true. So I do have that, um, those reference pictures up and I have to confess, I, I haven't been looking at them enough, but I probably should take a look here and just remind myself some of the interesting things that are going on. I like how this one has flat um, on the bottom that we can see it's a little bit darker and kind of there's like little, little pieces down there here if I zoom in some little bits breaking off from the main cloud. So I think that's something that we can bring into to this, maybe some tiny, smaller little clouds. Mm -hmm. Would you say you have like a most comfort zone thing to paint out of what you do? Definitely. Anything with um, a lot of foliage is probably my favorite thing to paint and most my in my comfort zone because I find it just with um, foliage and those kind of organic shapes, um, you can get away with so much. Like, unlike with painting portraits, you know, you can kind of, yeah, if you put a branch or something in the wrong place, it's it's not a big deal. Like where it's a nose would be um, a big problem if you <laughs> moved it over um, drastically. So yeah, I just find it very relaxing to paint nature, things like that, because there's just a lot of room to just, you know, you can have a reference picture if you want, and then you can kind of also make a lot of it up. And so I find that like very relaxing to do. Yeah, I, I do like painting things that are really organic like that for that reason. Mm -hmm. the, that said, I say put a nose wherever you want, you know, <laughs> it's your world. I mean, Picasso did it. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've painted a little bit of not so much landscapes, but I do remember doing some stuff where I was painting trees and rocks and I was like surprised at I mean, on paper, painting trees and rocks sounds incredibly boring. It just sounds super <laughs> dull. Um, but when I was doing it, I was like, this is actually really fun. There's so much texture and like so much form. And yeah, you, it's so organic that you, you're not really necessarily doing it wrong. You can get really creative with it. So 
actually really enjoyed it. I find rocks a very difficult subject to paint. Yeah, it's interesting just because of the, I feel like the hard and soft edges. There's like a lot of hard edges, but there's also a lot of like smooth kind of color transitions. And yes. Textural transitions. Mm -hmm. And there's all these different ways they like crack up. The, the rocks kind of like crack and break off in, in chunks and some are more ge very geometrical and others are more organic and yeah there's a lot of variety mm -hmm, definitely and uh, there's a comment from youtube um from vitalik that says uh your background character image is really attracting yeah i think uh that pop of red against the clouds is working super well Thank you. Good job, chat. Thank you for picking uh, the red dress. I think that was a great choice. <laughs> yeah, especially like with the green too, the complementary colors. There's a lot of uh, nice interactions going on in this one. Definitely. Yeah, when we talk about um, drawing attention to the focal area, there are like a few different things. Um, and, you know, we can have leading lines pointing in towards it. We can make sure that that area has high contrast, which I think it's the highest contrast right now and like color saturation um, and, and red, like red is the most eye-catching color, <laughs> so. Yeah, and it's working really well as like a little shape, like graphically that reads really nicely. Thanks. So I'm trying to think about the lighting, um, how it's hitting the cloud and just reminding myself that that's also how I have to uh, light her and the environment, at least roughly, you know, you can sort of get away oh, with a lot. When I paint, I try to just think, okay, if it, if you look at it and it works, it, it works. You, we, you don't necessarily need to get too scientific with it because I, I feel like that used to hold me back. I would get really stressed about like, is this accurate? And I think it's more like if it feels right, you know what I mean? And it, it, if you're close enough and it feels right, then I think that's fine. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. I mean, when it comes down to it, it's like, does it look cool? Does it look good? Yeah. There's, there's a lot of lighting. Even the cinematically, there's definitely movies that exist, especially like the more stylized ones where the lighting may not make sense. Like there's this crazy underlit red exactly. room light on a character and it's like, where is that coming from? But it's like, does it matter? It looks right. It looks cool. Yes, exactly. And I think when I was, when I was beginning in digital painting, I was really worried about that. And it I got hung up on that a lot. And then I realized like what you're saying, you know, a lot of movies, a lot of, I mean, yeah, you look at the, some of the artwork from um, some amazing artists and you're like, if you want to go and scrutinize it, maybe something doesn't make sense. Maybe there's a rim light that doesn't really have a cause, <laughs> but it looks awesome and it works. So yeah, you can, um, it's great to use reference and try to bring um, some realism in. So your piece is believable, but just don't let it like tie you down <laughs> too much. Yeah. And I think it, kind of goes back to what you said like it, it'll feel wrong if if it if yeah. it looks off you you can kind of tell like you'll look at it and something just won't feel right it, or it'll mm -hmm. just not quite look good to you like if this character you know had some crazy red <laughs> under lighting it might not make sense because you, we yeah. can see the environment that they're in but it, it kind of depends on the context i suppose mm -hmm. So I'm trying to think about the hill right now and what kind of lighting I want there to be because when it comes to very, very close to the viewer here, we do, there could be like a tree. Um, there could be things around us that could cause shadows that are not necessarily pictured. So it's like if I want, if we want to make the foreground in shadow, we, we probably could do that. Um, I think it might be interesting. Um, I really like variation of greens. So having a little bit of green um, in the shadow where we can put some of these sort of blue reflected light on the some of the foliage I think would be would feel really pretty in comparison to the yellow green that's like being hit by direct sunlight so I'm trying to make that work where we can have a little bit of shadow close to the, the foreground. Do you plan on putting foliage in this scene or is it just kind of a grassy uh, field? I think I would like to add some foliage um, and I was, I was thinking, you know, compositionally, we could maybe use that to our advantage somehow. Like one idea would be, um, and I have some, yeah, I have a million foliage brushes because I, I am obsessed. <laughs> but um, yeah, if I could just grab some real quick to show that an idea could be that we have 
some kind of uh, plants coming from the side and kind of create like a little bit of something like this. And so that would be like that we're almost in like a foresty area peeking out onto an open area and then seeing like this, this whole scene happening. Um, and that could be a cool thing too. At the very least, we can add some um, foliage close up, like closer to where we are. But I do kind of like that, that where you're like looking through the foliage in some way, it makes you feel more like in the scene and you're almost like, I don't know, like you've come upon this scene like you were just in in the forest or something yeah i think foreground elements are always really nice to add some depth and context and framing mm -hmm. the image is always kind of uh nice as well so yeah. i was actually curious about foliage but you just kind of showed me i was gonna say do you use a brush for that do you paint it individually but that brush was uh very cool like it, oh thanks it, it did uh so much so quickly yeah i absolutely love um brushes and making brushes um all these brushes I've made and um, yeah, just really helps to quickly add some some detail and, and things like that uh, texture, because I find that if like for me in traditional painting, I really like to use dry brushing textures and things where you take a brush stroke and yeah, maybe the paint doesn't have a lot of water. It's more dry and you can make a brush stroke. And it's kind of like a gritty brush stroke and then you get that sense of detail. And so um, for me with with painting in digital, I like to use brushes that kind of give that sort of effect where you can make a brush stroke and it kind of gives a bunch <laughs> of information with one brush stroke. Yeah, that's cool. So you've made a bunch of these brushes. Yeah, I, I really enjoy making them. And I've made some uh, brushes from my traditional, um, like I've made uh, traditional painting of brush tip shapes or textures and then scanned them and made brushes out of them. And I really enjoy doing that. So are these brushes available anywhere? Um, the ones that I'm using right now, um, some of these are available to my subscribers on Behance. Um, some of these foliage brushes are um, already things that that you can download there. And then I do also sell <laughs> some brush packs. Um, I think there's a link to my website. They're all all the, all the links to the brush sets can be found there. So if you guys wanted to check them out, um, that's where they are. <laughs> well, I'm definitely going to check them out because I was painting foliage sometime back for this. Uh animation illustration project I was doing and now I gotta have those brushes so oh awesome I'll, I'll definitely give it a look because those look really neat oh thank you also I think we had a um, question in chat let me see here also Annika says Maddie loves foliage <laughs> yeah I have a problem with foliage brushes <laughs> how many I have at this point <laughs> Let me see. I know we had a, um, okay, here it is. Uh, Yeevee has a question that I also have, which is, uh, what's the skill to dappled lighting? What's the, what's, what's the technique behind that? Are you comfortable um, with dappled lighting? Is that something you do often? Yeah, I love it. Um, I think it's a couple things. One is, well, like the values are the, are so important when in dappled lighting scenes, that's the things that makes it the most difficult. So if you're painting from a reference, just do the value, black and white value trick where you turn your painting into black and white, do the same thing with your reference and like really scrutinize them because that is how you improve the dappled lighting. It's just such a value dependent effect it, or value dependent effect. Yeah. To, to get the, um, the feeling of it. But I would say also, um, you don't have to paint the image exactly like a photo. So if you have a photo reference, um, those those um, splotches of light where they're hitting will really attract your attention a lot. So think about it. If there's like a really bright light going on, like down here, like right at the edge of the canvas, you might want to just not <laughs> paint that in, you know, because that's going to attract your attention a lot. So just think about where those those bright spotlights are and keep them like more in the center of your painting or more like around focal areas. You don't have to um, paint every single one that is in a photo. So be a little bit choosy, maybe paint a little bit less than there actually are. Cause sometimes it can just be like, it can overwhelm your, your scene. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, it's like a lot of the other things where it's a, uh, becomes kind of a compositional shape. Yes, exactly. Exactly. It really does. So it, those, those, bits of lighting, they um, they can be really distracting and it's beautiful, but you just have to like keep that in mind. So if you're doing a piece with dappled lighting, you would have like reference for that type of lighting uh, with your piece? 
I would. Yeah, I think it would be really tough to do it without reference, unless you've just painted dappled lighting scenes so much that you feel like you just really understand the lighting so well that you don't have to look at a guide. But I've painted dappled lighting a lot and I, I still would prefer to have something to look at because I feel like that's how you, I don't know, just nature. It's so beautiful. And I feel like there's always something when I'm looking at the photo that I, I notice and in how everything works, like the saturation of the colors around those areas is also can be can be different. So yeah, it's nice to have something to look at as a guide for that. Yeah, definitely. I think reference is really important overall. I think that's one of those things, like I said before, where sometimes I just try to try to get too quick with it. I'm like, oh, I'll just paint it in myself. But I feel like when you do that, one, the piece isn't going to turn out quite as well. And you're kind of depriving yourself from a learning opportunity because you can you can kind of fit studies into your personal work that way. Yeah. And I think that's a great way to keep growing. And that was one of the realizations I had where I was like, I got to use more reference and keep learning more lessons, keep, you know, pulling yeah. from actual reality and nature and everything. That's so true. Because every time you grab a reference for some area of your painting, that is like a mini study you get. Yeah, that's true. And sometimes, I mean, it can be hard to fit in dedicated studies if you're working full time, that type of thing. So might yes. as well, you know, fit those studies in when you're doing imaginative pieces. And on like, that, oh, go sorry, ahead. go ahead. I would say I like to use warp a lot when I paint clouds because a lot of times I notice in the sky that they have kind of like a stretched look. So um, that's just what I'm doing here. Oh yeah, that's that's a great technique for these uh, these clouds. The wispy ones. Yeah, I love the texture of those. Thanks. I think clouds are, are really cool in that way too because I've seen so many pieces, kind of what you're doing where there's these leading lines, like the clouds can create, you know, all these unique shapes in themselves, kind of like looping or swooping shapes, really anything. So it always gives that a little bit of dynamic look with those kind of swooping diagonals. Yeah. Have a good one, Fatima. Bye. Thanks for stopping by. Trying to add some little wisps, but without copying exactly what I did on the other side, because we want to have some variety. Now, when you make brushes, do you make them specifically for a purpose that you need? Like you run into something, and you're like, oh, I need this type of brush. Or do you ever just kind of like create them and experiment and find uses for them later? Um, I do like to have those times where you just experiment and just mess around with stuff. But usually what's spurred it on is that I want to try to paint in a certain style. That That's what I've noticed has happened in the past. Like I'll see... The, my, the first brush that, that I made was because I was um, wanted to do like a Studio Ghibli inspired painting, which is kind of this one is this is a bit Ghibli inspired, I have to admit. <laughs> but yeah, I was um, trying to paint in that style and I felt like with the hard round brush, which is a great tool, um, but I felt like I couldn't get some of the effects of how things looked in their background paintings. Um, and so I was like, I'm going to try to make some brushes for this. And then later I wanted to try to, because I paint in gouache traditionally, I was like, oh, I want some some digital brushes that are more like the, the way that I paint in gouache. And so then I made brushes for that. So it's usually inspired by me wanting to paint in a certain style and then feeling like I need slightly more specific tools for that and then trying to make those. Yeah, yeah, that's a, I think that's a great way to go about it. Great way to kind of learn from them too. Yeah, I do end up learning a lot every time I make a brush set because I notice I'm I'm really studying those styles and trying to figure out like what kind of brushwork is there and yeah, how to make those kind of brush strokes. Yeah. Also, welcome on into Fanny. I uh, was asking, are you using a reference pick? And then uh, Annika mentioned that, yeah, Maddie had us choose from a few in the beginning <laughs> and we've been talking about reference quite a bit. Yeah, having yeah. having various images to pull from. stressing yeah. for me today the importance of reference so it's a good lesson yeah the the um the second image here even though we painted the idea of the red dress i kind of used her dress as inspiration where you could see that little shadow in between the front and the back of her dress so it really makes it look three-dimensional like you like her dress is like a cone shape 
Um, so that's what I tried to, I tried to bring a little bit of that reference in here to show like the shape of her dress blowing in the wind and that it's like three dimensional. So I'll show you guys what layers I have at this point. Um, I've got the background layer and then some wispy clouds. I guess I can merge those two layers. I try to like keep somewhat minimal layers. So I merge what I think I can. Um, and then, yeah, grass. I've got this foliage on a separate layer for now. I might merge it down, but I'm not sure 100% of it yet. So that's it. Yeah, that's good. That's organized. Do you ever name your layers? I know this always no. comes up in streams. <laughs> Yeah, I know people, I don't know, have very strong feelings about it. I do not just because, okay, there's two main reasons. One is because I merge a lot and, you know, you kind of lose the name or it, it takes the name of one layer and then you have to rename it. And also, um, you know, I'm using stylus in one hand and then I've got my other hand on the keyboard shortcuts. And I just feel like I have to break up my whole flow to like type in the name. It's just not worth it to me. Yeah. I mean, I think it also depends on like how manageable your layers are because, you know, the more you get, the more kind of important yeah. I guess it is to group and name but uh I, I do that too I merge a lot so I think the current layers I'm painting on a lot of times won't get a name but mm -hmm. I think once I'm like done like okay this is the mask I'm not touching that this is the flat colors I may come that, back to that yeah I'll, I'll name those but uh I try not to have like a million layers because that can get overwhelming for me yeah same also, Annika's coming in with the Have We Saved? Also to save, oh. sip, and stretch. Thank you. Yes. Control. <laughs> I, I think I, I control S a lot, like without, like on autopilot, but I always like to double check. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes if you get like the muscle memory, it's it's almost hard to remember. Like, have I? Have I saved? Exactly. Thanks, no, Annika. Have no idea. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Oliver's coming in here with some controversial words saying naming layers is overrated. <laughs> like, okay, if I'm gonna, if I have to share the file with someone, then I will, I'll name them for, for that purpose. Yeah. But if it's just me, okay, but because also here's something that I actually didn't know when I first was painting in Photoshop, like, and it was it just blew my mind when I learned it, <laughs> um, is the auto select of the layer or group. Like at first I had no idea this existed. So basically if you have your move tool selected up here, um, if you check auto select and if you have it on layer, then basically when you tap down on your canvas, it's gonna like select, oops, I have turned it off. It's gonna activate automatically um, whatever you click on. So the cloud, you'll see it changing depending on what I'm clicking on, it'll activate that layer. So I'm like, why, you know, this is doing everything for me. Like I don't mm. need to name them because I can just find the cloud easily with auto select, you know, everything is easy to find. Oh, wow. That's a great tip. I don't, I don't know if I ever use that. I'm going to have to check if I have auto select on. I don't, I must not. Yeah. I, I, I didn't know about it for a while. And then I, I was like, what? Oh my gosh. <laughs> so yeah, it's super handy. If you have a lot of layers with transparent effects, then it becomes less useful because you're going to click on a layer that's not really what you want. But if you, if you don't have a lot of those effects, then it's it works great. Mm -hmm. Also, Bruce says you're both on Twitch, right? Have you guys ever joined each other's streams? Curious. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, how long have you been streaming on Twitch from? Um. Well, it's been a while that I, I haven't popped on there in a while now but i did start streaming there like what was it, like five years ago now or something okay. it's crazy yeah because i was gonna say i think we both go fairly far back on yeah uh, on streaming on twitch yeah it's funny a lot of the same faces pop up kind of in the you know streaming uh community um with twitch and and behance and everything so i feel like a lot of the people from the creative community on Twitch years ago, you know, we all kind of know each other to some degree. Yeah, it's true. It's true. I remember popping in because I, you were already streaming when I first came to uh, Twitch and I remember seeing you doing like um, the art art club stuff that you were doing. And then oh, yeah. that, that kind of inspired me. I ended up doing like an art club for a while, but it's really fun. It's great. 
Um, and that's one of the things I love here when I stream on Behance um, on Wednesdays. Uh, we always like do studies together and people can paint along and stuff. And I think I think it's so much fun. I love like that's such a fun way to do your art studying is to do it with friends, you know? For sure. Yeah, that's what um, yeah, way back when doing like challenges and mm -hmm. uh, study challenges, too. And I, I think that does make it a lot more fun because you get to see everyone's interpretation of it. It kind of exactly. just it's that motivating thing where everyone else is painting, doing these cool studies and getting better and you want to do the same thing. So I think it's yeah, a great, yep. uh, great thing to have. When you're struggling on a difficult reference picture, everyone's <laughs> everyone's struggling together and um, yeah, it helps you like push through on those difficult ones. Yeah. And there's something really cool about being able to see how other people solve the same problem and how they interpreted it. So, so if, true. if you're struggling with something, you may be like, oh, how did these people do it? And you're like, oh, I see what they did or like that works really well. And yeah, I think it's a great learning opportunity. That's very true. Evie says, never been on Twitch. My son is on a lot, though. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think I was streaming back in 2015 is when I first started uh, my whole adventure into the streaming world. And I've never turned back. <laughs> I mean, if you're if you're an artist, you know, you're working at home so much kind of in your studio. So it's nice to have that community. That is absolutely why I started streaming because I was working from home and I was just I don't know, it felt a little bit isolating after a while. And I was like, I just want to hang out with people while I'm doing this. I'm, I'm painting anyway, might as well hang out. And then, yeah, best decision ever. Yeah, that was 100 percent my uh my reason for starting too. Annika's asking if we can demo auto select again. Oh yeah, sure. Okay. So you want to have the, um, the, I think this is called the move tool, the four arrows in different directions on top of the toolbar here, or mine's on the top, <laughs> but this is the tool you're looking for. Um, and when you have that selected, then up here on the menu, you just want to make sure there's a, this is checked. Auto select is checked. And then you can have it, um, select the layer or the group. So if you're using a lot of groups, then yeah, you might want to choose that. I usually want it on layer for how I work. I don't usually have a ton of groups. So yeah, I just have auto select layer. And then basically you can click wherever you click down on your canvas. You can see over here on my layers palette, um, it's going to activate whatever I click on. It's just going to take me right to that layer. So you can, you know, drag things and paint on them, <laughs> but super handy. Yeah, that's a great, uh, great tool to have, especially if you have everything organized into like the system you do now where it's all clear that the sky is a separate layer, the clouds, the grass. The exactly. Figure. Mallory says, uh, what time does stream start? So this stream started one hour ago. We'll be back again tomorrow at the same time, um, 930 Pacific time. So definitely check it out. And a little reminder to anyone who's watching over on YouTube that if you want us to see your questions or comments the most easily, um, it would be over here on the Behance chat. I love how these clouds have developed. There's definitely like the softness to them and the, the um, kind of blending between the purple shadow tones and the blue, I think looks really cool. Oh, thank you. Definitely One thing I'm looking- some nice depth now. Thank you. Um, I'm trying to think about the, I, I feel like I almost have maybe a little bit of a tangent going on or something. Um, when I say tangent, I just mean like these, the cloud and the edge of the ridge of the grass, they're kind of like just lined up perfectly right now. And I feel like, I feel like it could be more interesting um, if we, if we change that up somehow. I'm not sure exactly how. I think maybe I could make this these darker parts of the cloud kind of come up higher. So it's like as if the bottom of the cloud starts a little bit higher up rather than like right at that grassy ridge. I'm going to try to change that. Move it up a little higher. And we could even show some of the sky under the cloud, but I think it's best to kind of have the it be all clouds right at the bottom here. 
Yeah, I think the the cloud touching all the way to the bottom kind of gives it this really like grand look where it's tower, you know, it's coming up from low and going all the way up. It just makes it look really large, which is cool. Awesome. Okay, that's what I want. So we'll keep the cloud going all the way. Yeah, it looks like it's like taking up the whole scene. So it's a neat look. I love big clouds like this. Yeah, so maybe it gives more depth if I can add like some smaller little clouds slightly in front of the bigger one. So that's gonna get a little bit into more detail. So do you do any video content outside of uh, streaming? I kind of dabbled in that, but I, I really like live so much more. Um, I've done, I have a, a few, like maybe three or four YouTube videos out there. They're all the uh, gouache painting videos. And um, other than that, all my brush sets, I usually do like a, a demo video going with them. Um, but other than that, I mostly just stream live. I find it just so much more fun. <laughs> I don't really love the editing process of making videos and all that. Yeah, I can definitely relate there. Streaming is just like you're doing your thing anyway, just go live and do it. but. Yeah. Pre recorded content, you kind of want to script it out a little bit, the editing, all that. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's a lot more work. Yeah. And when it comes to teaching, like there's pros and cons to both. And I do really like the aspect of streaming where you can answer questions. So if you're trying to get like show something and somebody doesn't understand, they can just ask you right then and there. And I think that is something awesome about streaming. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. If you guys have any questions, let me know. EB says, love painting with gouache. So another gouache fan. Oh, yes. I think gouache is a great medium for people that um, like doing digital art. I feel like it's a great transition. For anybody who's listening, um, digital artists that might want to dabble in traditional, um, gouache is like really vibrant colors. You can paint really clean with it if you want in graphic, or you can paint more painterly. And you can um, paint light colors over dark colors on like watercolor. So I find for me, like it's way more intuitive. Yeah, I've, um, I think I've literally used gouache once, like when I first got into art and I was taking a couple classes at the local community college and we had to do like one thing one time with gouache. Oh, but cool. That's the only time I've ever used it. I do know a lot of people seem to like it though. It's, it seems like a pretty popular medium. Yeah, it's, it's so much fun. I, it's just, um, I feel like it's pretty low maintenance compared to like oil painting or something like that you know you don't have any special solvents or anything um <clears throat> it can it can be portable you know if you like to do plain air and stuff you can paint over mistakes easily in it so yeah there's definitely a lot of a lot of cool things about it yeah that's neat uh pavlos wants to know if there the chat is going to share their works in the end um I think Pavlos mentioned before that they're doing a character or something. So if anyone oh, cool. wants to paint along or draw along, definitely feel free. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, I don't know if, uh, Maddie, if you have anywhere for people to share, but we do have the Photoshop Discord where you can, um, there's a section for like other designs not related to the challenges. So you can always share there. That's one place. Yeah, and also, it, yeah, in my Discord server as well, there's like Share Your Art channel, and you guys could also post in there, um, of course. And where's the easiest, or where's the easiest link for people to go to to find your Discord link? Um, it should just be um, discord.gg slash Maddie. I got um, my name there, so oh, nice. I think you can find it pretty, pretty easily that way. Or um, my website should have a link to my Discord too, so if you go to art, uh, by maddie.com then there should be a way to get through there <laughs> nice thanks for posting that annika um there's several adobe discords but there's just one photoshop discord we also have them for like adobe xd and illustrator and some of the other um adobe softwares 
I'm trying to take a look at the value thing here, because if you guys can see, um, there's a little issue right now where the top of the hill is like the same value as the clouds behind it, where so I feel like, I don't know, I feel like it would be better if there was a little bit of differentiation there. In the reference pictures, usually what's happening is the clouds are lighter in, in this picture and up here. Um, but both of those, the clouds are slightly different than the one I'm painting. And you can see the bottom is dark on this cloud. So it's kind of tricky. I'm trying to decide like, basically one of these things needs to be lighter or darker than the other. Which one should it be? Yeah, it's you it's know? tough. I mean, the, the contrast of the hues definitely separates it, but yeah, value, they're very similar. Yeah. I would maybe just try like one layer for each, you know, one layer where you darken the clouds one layer where you darken the grass and kind of see. That's a good idea. But since the the grass, it looks like it's being hit with, yeah, that's tricky because it's being hit with light. Right, but we could darken it. Like maybe it doesn't need that light right there or maybe maybe it could be darker up there but have light kind of like leading up oh, to her. Yeah, that, that makes sense. It, it could be something. I'm doing this on a separate layer. So if we don't like it, we can get rid of it. That's usually but, what I have to do because I've had those questions where it's like, is this darker or is this darker? And I usually just yeah. have to make two layers and try both and see what looks most natural to me. Pablo says the painting looks great. And uh, Mallory says maybe the, the grass should be darker. Yeah, we'll have to see. All right. Thanks, you guys. Yeah, I think, yeah, I mean, based on the reference photos, it does indeed seem like the grass should be the darker one. <clears throat> so. If I, and also when you have these questions, you can look at it as a thumbnail. You know, at the thumbnail, I don't really mind the light, kind of like the light better. Yeah, I think just based off that, I, I like yeah. the light. That's, it's weird, but sometimes you've just got to zoom out because then you're really, you know, taking the big picture. Yeah, I'd be curious to see the light grass with like the darker cloud base and. Okay, it's, let's make the tricky. cloud. Yeah, we can maybe take an airbrush and just, I'm gonna create a clipping mask onto the cloud and um, put the layer on multiply and just do like a little you know, shading there. I don't wanna look, look too stormy because look, it can get stormy really quick. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> then it's like a bit ominous. Hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, maybe it's maybe it's okay where it is for now. I don't know. I have this thing. Um, I used to get really stuck a lot <laughs> in my in my paintings, and I would like I would come across a question, and then I would kind of hit my head against the wall. Like sometimes you can answer the question right away, but sometimes you can't. And so I kind of found sometimes like just move on if you can. If that if that question isn't like absolutely stopping your progress in the painting. Um, just move on and see if you can get in a flow again and then go back to try to answer that question like later on when you're in a better flow. Yeah, that's a great tip. And sometimes you're just seeing it fresh again and you've had time to process it. Yeah, so I'm just going to work on painting the cloud a bit and then maybe I'll take another look down there and see if I want to change anything or not. So we talked a little bit about like your most comfort zone stuff. Do you have something that's least comfort zone for you? <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, anything that's like highly, highly technical with like a lot of perspective. That's usually what I try to avoid. <laughs> okay. I can relate to that for sure. <laughs> so like uh, mechs or like, you know, airplanes, like any of that kind of stuff, you know, um, city scenes with like tons of buildings. Um, I mean, like I, I I can do it, but it will take me a long time with all the perspective that you need to sort out. And it's, it's definitely not relaxing for me. <laughs> well, see, Maddie, I was under the impression that there was going to be a giant mech off in the distance coming <laughs> up over the horizon. <laughs> okay. Maybe if it's like Howl's Moving Castle kind of mech where it's like okay. all wonky. <laughs> <laughs> Little uh, Ghibli. Um, yeah. That would be about my speed. Yeah, I could see that in this uh, in this painting. 
yeah. Definitely has some of those vibes. <laughs> is uh, Studio Ghibli a, a big influence on you, on your style at all? Yeah, it is, definitely. I absolutely love their, the, I mean, the whole feeling that you get from watching their films, but especially the background paintings. I mean, I can just stare at them. I they're so skillful the painters that do these backgrounds it's amazing and i love the lighting and the soft blends and it's just it's very inspiring yeah i remember there's a period where i was just saving references and backgrounds from various movies just because like the level of skill in those paintings is just so good and they're still like painterly too it's not like they're photorealistic yes. but just everything about them is just so well done it's crazy yeah, they absolutely nail that balance between, I mean, some of them, I mean, they can be very realistic and precise, but then yeah. they also have a little bit of whimsy. It's just like a little bit, there's like almost a filter of like, you're seeing it through, um, I don't know, like a memory, like a nice memory instead of like a photo exact realistic painting. Uh, I mean, photo, it's a, a painting that has so much emotion put in it with these environments. like even just the most everyday scene just has a little bit more something special to it. Like you can see it in a new way. Like they see the beauty in like an old rusted flower pot overgrown with plants and stuff like that. And I, I love it. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, I don't know, like the level of skill in those is crazy because I believe they were all done traditionally and just looking at that, I, I don't know. I was, uh, it's definitely inspiring and it's kind of something I, I want to go back to now because I just remember how cool those scenes were. Like the rocks and the trees, that was actually when I was painting those previously. I was looking at uh, those references. Yeah, the, it's amazing. The rocks especially. <laughs> the rocks and the foliage, it's, it's like, and the, the moss and everything on the rocks. It's like, yeah, it's so beautiful. Exactly. So speaking of that, are there any artists in particular that you really look up to or admire or whose work you try to try to learn from? Yeah, there's there's a lot. I would say um, some of the big ones would be uh, Nathan Fawkes and James Gurney. Um, James Gurney does beautiful. I mean, he paints in a lot of mediums, but his gouache painting is really what um, I love most. And he has a lot of great videos on YouTube of you know, his techniques and things. And that's been really helpful to me. Um, also, there's an artist, um, Tiffany Mang, who does like amazing, beautiful color work. And her, yeah, it inspires me how she uses color and light. So those are probably like my top favorites right now. Do you know how to spell her last name? Um, I think it's M-A-N-G. Tiffany Mang. Okay, I'll have to look mm -hmm. that up. Haven't heard of her. I know Nathan Fox, of course. Um, his stuff's uh, amazing especially yeah. color wise. I believe he actually has some uh, classes online too. Some various, um, I think he has some stuff on uh, schoolism. I remember right. wanting to look into that because there was some some classes I wanted to take on schoolism and he had a few that I definitely was was interested in. Yeah, I've done um, his, his watercolor and gouache class on schoolism is really, really good. Definitely recommend it. To anyone looking to get into those mediums yeah there's some of those um classes on schoolism that are like focused on color and light there's a few of those that i was mm -hmm. really intrigued by annika says he made me fall in love with plein air painting nice yeah that's awesome plain air painting is is a lot of fun it's also it also can be a lot of it can be a lot of work to do, so I don't do it nearly as much as I should. Yeah, it, it seems intimidating to me. Also, I guess Annika was referring to uh, James Gurney. He does a lot of plein air painting for sure. Oh yeah, that's if, right. If anyone follows him on, I believe Instagram or anything like that, I think he posts a lot of plein air painting videos. <laughs> Uh, apparently Nathan Fox is not a human. Most people don't know this. <laughs> he is a wizard, according to Pavlos. I, I believe <laughs> it. I could see that. It would explain a lot. 
It would really explain a lot. That type of power is, is uncommon in the human realm. <laughs> Bruce says, do you guys take schoolism courses? I have not, but I've been meaning to for, for literally years at this point. It's on my forever being put off to-do list just because uh, of my hectic schedule, but they yeah. have some great ones. Do you take any or have you taken yeah, any? Yeah, uh, I've done it. Had a, I've done a few and I'm trying to remember which ones that I did. Um, I did a couple from Nathan Fox. Just when I had a subscription there, I was just popping into different classes. Um, yeah, it's definitely, definitely, I would recommend. Yeah, there's some great resources out there. I mean, in terms of paid and free tutorials and courses. So definitely mm -hmm. good to take advantage of those. There was one on schoolism that I was particularly interested in, which was it was something it was called something like light and color by um the tonko house guys which is like robert kondo and dice susumi i believe so that's one that's been on my uh my cool. list forever oh there was a visual storytelling i think victoria ying i took that one too i just remembered that was a really good one oh i'll have to look that one up yeah so i'm trying to play with the idea of um, the foreground foliage and things, we talked about that. And I'm thinking, you know, I'm just thinking like balance wise and weight in the composition, how much of that I want, because we could go really intense with it. We could have just like some little grasses poking up here, or we could try something more drastic where we have like a plant that's like really up close, like something that comes up here and actually breaks through that, um, you know, the, the top of the, the hill. And that can be really dynamic sometimes. I think um, also like just in general pointing towards her and you know having some leaves that that might be just the more logical way to go about it. Or yeah. a little bit of both. Yeah, I think that could be nice for some depth. Mm -hmm. And that's a good tip to anyone in chat, you know, just on the topic of composition is having leading lines things that you can direct the eye to the the focal point like the plants pointing to the figure off in the distance you can a lot of times control the the shapes you're creating to kind of point at the focal point if you want to exactly and this is one thing that foliage makes it really easy because you can yeah aim a branch in any direction and it feels it can feel pretty natural um, but you can also do this with other elements you can kind of manipulate things just a little bit change them just a little bit to to fit that um, purpose but foliage definitely makes it super easy oh cool uh mirko says they took the uh daisusumi one the color and light they said oh, it's cool. pretty great so that's neat to hear. Nice. So I'm thinking maybe, um, so when it comes to focal points, we also want to consider like focal areas. Like we definitely want the focal point to be working where it draws our eye to this one specific place first. That's like the main point, but it's also nice to have maybe a couple other areas that are interesting to look at to like lead our eye around the page the composition so i was thinking of maybe having a little area here where there's some of this foliage in the um in the grass that gets a little bit more detail so this is just kind of like figuring out where it's going to go but i think we can have like a little tuft here because right now it feels like there's just nothing going on down here and so maybe a little bit boring so hopefully this will give our eye like some things to bounce around sort of in this area mm -hmm. Put something down here. So with these types of pieces, do you have a pretty set workflow figured out in terms of like how long it takes or does it vary depending on the piece? It, it, it definitely can vary because sometimes you know how it is you get really into a painting and you just start like detailing adding so much detail that phase can go on for a long time sometimes you know um you can take that pretty far yeah i would say yeah definitely a few hours but it could go up to i would say eight hours six eight hours for a personal work is pretty normal for me and um, this one won't take that long, <laughs> but like, yeah, it definitely, I definitely can spend around that much time if I want to like get in there and start individually drawing leaves with little shines and make it really polished. Yeah. So just depending on how detailed you want to get. Exactly. 
Actually, that reminds me, um, Robert, who I believe is in chat, was the one who told me that you have a like Photoshop timer, like a little plugin. Oh yeah. I believe you have that on your store, correct? Um, that is, it is, it's not on my shop. That was actually, um, my partner made that because I was always wishing that I had something like that. And he does web development and stuff and he made this plugin. So um, it's linked um, in a few different places. If you go to my my Instagram um, and scroll down, there's a post that, that links to it. But um, yeah, but it is on the Adobe Exchange, the the marketplace. I, I hope I, I don't know if I said the right name, but there's a marketplace, Adobe marketplace that it's on. Um, and it's also, I think on Gumroad and ArtStation marketplace. It's on a few places, but um, yeah, let's see. I don't have it right now open. Yeah, so up here, the timer, it can work like a stopwatch or um, to just kind of count how long you've been painting, or you can have it count down from a certain amount of time. So I do use this to like manage my time when I'm painting a lot. Okay. Yeah, I need to, I need to look into something like that because um, I feel like sometimes I'll bounce between pieces so much or I'll, I'll noodle on one thing and then jump out of that document into another. And I have a project that I'm working on where I want to be consistent. You know, I'm like, okay, this is phase one of the project and I got to move on to phase two, phase three and so on. So I think having some sort of tool like that where I can kind of keep track of how long I'm spending on everything and keep it orderly is, is nice to have for sure. Yeah, you know, and you can use any timer, but for me, it's just nice having it in Photoshop because it's just very convenient. This is where you're working, but um, I, I like to use them for the the speed paints and timed studies and things because otherwise I'll just keep going. Like I have to keep checking up there and be like, oh, I have 30 minutes left. Okay. I got to simplify more. I can't, I can't get stuck, you know, and stuff like that it keeps me yeah. going. Yeah. It's kind of a reminder too. And I feel like whenever I have that timed reminder, it's not like I feel rushed. It's more like, oh yeah, I shouldn't noodle on this tiny detail that no one's going to see. I should focus yeah. on like what's going to impact the big picture exactly oh and annika linked to uh to it in the chat thanks annika oh thank you so yeah in this stream i'm, I'm trying to um, i know we've done a fair amount of detailing on the cloud but i am trying to stick to um like big picture things and um we're going to be working on this image tomorrow too so we're going to get a chance to like for example the the foreground the details uh, that we want to put a little bit more polish on and things like that. Um, we'll get a chance to like delve deeper into the details. Okay, cool. That'll be nice to see. Yeah. And I just realized <laughs> how much of the stream has gone by already. Time's flying. Yeah. It always goes so fast. I mean, that's how I feel like, I feel like when I do streams on my own, typically Sometimes I'm running short on time, but I like to have at least two hours to work because it just flies by. So true. It goes really, really fast. Like when you're doing, um, when you're streaming, especially when, because I usually do timed studies. And again, that like makes time fly. Like if you ever want time to go faster, you're waiting for something and you're feeling impatient, just do like a timed study and it will be, <laughs> time will pass by like, five times faster than usual. Did you say you do the study streams uh, once a week or is it more than that? It's every, yeah, once a week, every Wednesday. And I stream at 2 p.m. CEST. And we usually do um, like one or two paintings in a stream. Okay, nice. That's actually something I've literally been trying to get into the past uh, couple weeks. I'm trying to get my schedule consistent with it, but just fitting in studies because I realized Kind of the same thing I said about reference before, but I realized I need to reference more things, but I also need to fit in some proper studies. So I was trying to make like one stream a week, a study stream. Um, but I think that's a super good thing to have. Just that consistent practice is really important. Yeah, I, I think so too. And it, it kind of adds up if you think like, you know, um, a couple hours a week, it doesn't, it doesn't sound like a crazy amount, but like it really, really helps. Yeah. Makes a big difference. Like, you know, over the month, you've done quite a bit of work. Exactly. So I'm using a, a brush that has a little bit more texture to it. Um, this is something that I like to do a lot. You guys saw that I basically had blocked in everything here and I started 
kind of shading it with um, like just a regular soft flat brush that didn't have much texture to it. And now I'm going on top and just kind of like adding some interesting brush strokes. But these brush strokes are kind of benefiting from what was already there. I don't usually like to use super textured, complicated brushes um, when I'm doing like my base shapes and stuff. I kind of stick with um, more simple brushes to block things in. And then as we get further in the process, then I can, I kind of go on top of there and add like some extra flair and textures and stuff. Um, cause I feel like texture is more like the icing on the cake rather than the actual cake. Yeah. Yeah. It can be super tempting for me to get into texture early, but I have to remind myself of that. Yeah. It is very satisfying to do though. It really, it really is. Once you have all that foundational stuff in place, it really starts pulling it together and adding some nice interest. Yeah, that's that's absolutely my favorite part. So I'm getting to do a little bit a little bit of it now, even though um, the next stream will be mainly when we get into all the juicy texture details. Um, but I'm trying to remember to keep you know keep a big um, a larger brush, keep some big brush strokes in because yeah, I want the painting to feel fresh, and so I I don't want to make my brush too small. Um, I I want to kind of yeah, keep that big brush. That's something James Gurney said, you know, use the largest brush you can for as long as you can. And I find that somehow a little bit easier in traditional art because you're actually holding a specific sized brush. And in digital, I've got my keyboard shortcuts and I try to tell myself like, don't make the brush smaller. But then next thing you know, my left hand's like, click, 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 click. Yeah. <laughs> it's like I think, hard. <laughs> I think that's great advice. That's like up there with my top, you know, two more most helpful tips for myself. And oh. The, the other one is actually something I I just noticed now, but I don't think you've really zoomed in this painting, have you? Oh my gosh, yes, you're right. I had to break that habit of zooming in. Yeah, and now I try, I, I literally would, I would tell myself like, you, you cannot zoom in until your painting is like almost done. Basically until I feel like I actually cannot paint at this size anymore. Cause you'll get to a point yeah. where you wanna paint a detail and you're like, you literally can't see and then you have to zoom in. But I try to force myself to not zoom in until I get to that point because, oh man, because when I used I used to literally be like in here just like <laughs> doing a pixel, and then you zoom out and you're like, oh my god, what have I done? <laughs> I feel like we are kindred spirits because this is like there's so many things that I'm like, yes, totally, I'm all about that. <laughs> like that's my biggest tip for myself, and I guess in general is, don't zoom in. Like I try yeah. not, I should almost just disable it completely, but <laughs> I, I do the same thing when I, I'll, I'll be allowed to zoom in when I have to, you know, when everything's mm -hmm. kind of done and exactly to detail it a bit more, I got to zoom in a little bit at the end, but I find that using a big brush, but specifically not zooming in has like helped my work more than anything else as simple and silly as it might sound. It's just it makes you focus on the whole piece. You know, it makes you focus on being efficient with your your brush strokes and getting the big values down, the big shapes, you know? I just feel like it, it automatically kind of makes you go into a lot of good habits. It's so true. It is so true. And honestly, it's funny because streaming really helped with that too, because I noticed that um, it, what would happen is sometimes I'd be really zoomed in and then people would come into the stream and they'd be hanging out for like 10 minutes. They'd be like, so uh, what are you painting? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've had that too. <laughs> I'd be like, oh yeah, <laughs> let's zoom out. Yeah. It's like, it's better for everyone if we uh, can see the whole image actually. <laughs> I've been there. Yeah, that's a good point because I've been to other people's streams too and they're like, just zoomed in the whole time on there. Sometimes people do have a secondary window, like a navigator window or something. Yeah, that's handy. Which is good, but yeah, I think it's good habit just to be <laughs> further out the whole time. Speaking of the navigator window, I actually do like to have it open. And I have this, um, just as a tip for anyone in case this is helpful, I have this on my other monitor because um, I, I am painting on a Cintiq and then I have a, the other monitor where I can see my references. And I like to keep this over there because it's also not only is this a thumb sort of a thumbnail size compared to my painting, but it's also like further away from me. So I kind of have like a real thumbnail view of it. And that helps me to glance over at it every once in a while and just make sure that things are um, working at that size. So if your painting works as, at a thumbnail, that's a really good sign that it reads well, whether it's like values, composition and everything. So I definitely recommend something like that. Yeah, that's helpful. I usually have, um, or I oftentimes have a window on my other monitor too. And 
just to glance at kind of a different yeah. way to get it. Because you can also just zoom out, but sometimes you forget to do that <laughs> uh, for a while. Um, Mervin has a question, which is, can we be can become a good digital artist if we haven't done traditional painting? Yes, definitely. 100%. That's my opinion. I don't know if you have a different opinion. Um, well, I have learned to paint entirely digitally, so... There you go! Um, <laughs> I, hope, I hope it's true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, 100%. Yeah, I... I, I mean, the, tra the skills are very transferable, which is awesome. So if you um, start painting digitally and then get into traditional painting, that's going to be... That's going to make a lot easier for you. And either way, either way. But... Yeah. You don't would, have to do it in any order. Yeah, I would say you can definitely become a good digital artist if you haven't done traditional painting because it's really just a medium. It's a question of like, what medium are you using? Whether you're using watercolor, gouache, oil, acrylic, pastels, or digital, you're, you're doing the same thing. You're making shapes, you're making choices on value, you're making choices on color, um, composition. Yes. All these fundamentals of art are present in any medium that you can possibly do. The medium is just like, you know, art time, art takes a lifetime to learn, but the medium can be learned in maybe a month. Maybe it'll take you a month to get really comfortable painting in oils if you do it a lot or using the software if you want to do digital. But um, it's really just using the learning to use the tools, which is a lot easier to pick up than, you know, all the fundamentals associated with art. That's so true. It really is all the like, like exactly what um, Sam said with the values and color and all that it's um it's all the same i mean and yeah you have to learn the specifics you know and and everything but it's i had a kind of a weird path um i started with traditional drawing and i um drew for like many many years and that was my passion i like pen and ink and stuff like that pencil drawings and then i got into digital painting and then i did that for like five years i didn't do any drawing in that time or any traditional i was like all digital and then I and then I was like, you know what? I want to get into traditional painting. I've never done that, which kind of feels silly at this point. So I started doing that. But it's like I learned all the color through digital painting because before digital painting, I'd only ever done black and white drawings. So it was like it was just a weird path. I, I did have traditional background, but then all the painting, color theory, and everything came from what I learned doing digital painting. Um, and when I got into traditional painting, I think it made it so much easier. You know, I just had to, like you said, get used to the medium, but, you know, all the basics, um, fundamentals are the same. Yeah, definitely. And it's funny, you do have those associations. Like I know a lot of traditional painters who started that way will talk about colors with like how it relates to the, the tube that they use, you know, oh, yeah. red or whatever it might be. But <laughs> since I'm yeah. so, so brought up on Photoshop, I'm like, well, it's like a like a blue green more towards blue the saturation is <laughs> maybe like halfway and the values maybe like you know the lower 20 percent <laughs> i'm thinking in terms of like color sliders yeah yeah definitely um elizabeth was saying how do you pick your brushes do you make custom brushes and yeah we were talking about how uh, maddie has a lot of her own custom brushes that she's made but um do you have a method for like which brush you want to choose in what circumstances? Um, yeah, I usually start off with fairly um, basic brushes for blocking things in, like a hard round brush or like a square or something pretty solid. And then as as the painting progresses, I usually get into more textures. There can be exceptions. Like I did these little wispy clouds early on and they were pretty textured brushes. Um, but for the most part, I get into textured things like a little bit later on in the process when I'm you know, trying to add those details because texture is detail, you know, texture and noise. It's like in, in traditional, you know, I use more water at the beginning part of the, the painting process because that gives like more smooth um, transitions. And at the end, I do dry brushing, which gives like gritty texture. And it's basically the same thing with um, digital. Like I start off with soft, um, not necessarily soft, but yeah, brushes that don't have a lot of crazy edges, like pretty, um, generally pretty basic brushes and then they get like more and more textured as they go yeah that makes a lot of sense um elizabeth also has a follow-up question of do you have a favorite brush ah uh, mm, 
Oh my gosh, this is like the hardest question for me to ever answer. <laughs> <laughs> so hard to choose. <laughs> I, I go through phases, like I'll be obsessed with a certain brush for like two months and then I'll be, and then I'll go to a different brush, but probably not. I probably don't have a favorite for a really long time. I liked this, um, this flat brush that I made. That's like literally the most basic brush. Like it, it doesn't have anything fancy, like textures or anything. Um, but this, this kind of brush, I really liked for a long time, just for like the blocking in. Um, I do like flat brushes a lot. I like flat brushes in both traditional and digital painting, but no, I, I, I really don't have like an all time favorite. Cause I, I do change my preferences pretty often. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's, that's cool. It's always good to kind of experiment with different ones. And a lot of times it seems like it's very situational for what you're using. So that's exactly right. Yeah. Depending on the painting and the style. Cause I do like to paint different styles. Like I think probably my style is a very weird thing where it's, it's a lot hard for us to kind of see our own style sometimes. Um, but I do like to, to paint in different kind of ways. Like sometimes I'll paint more clean sometimes I'll paint more painterly or at least that. So yeah, I'll just, I'll see like a, a reference image. Like if I'm saying, Oh, I want to paint this. Sometimes it just will appear that way to me where I'll say, I want to paint this like really um, oil painting, like emotive, like lots of like looser painting style. And then I'll have to use brushes that help with that. Like for me using like the hard round brush is great when you want to do like very clean detailed rendering and you want to paint everything yourself. But I, I can't use that brush to do like an expressive oil painting style painting, you know? So I kind of, it just really, really, really does depend on what kind of style painting I'm trying to do. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. It's definitely a very personal preference thing. I know people have like really, really different tastes with that. So I would say you guys like definitely try out a lot of brushes, even stuff that you might think is kind of weird or that doesn't initially appeal to you. Just like try different things because you might find something you really like that you don't expect. Um, and, you know, if you have the um, uh, the Creative Cloud subscription, like if you if you have Photoshop, then you can download the Kyle Webster brushes. And there's so many brushes and they're so good. And there's like a million <laughs> different brush sets now. So you can um, try them if you go to, uh, yeah, you click on your brush here, bring down this menu, click the cog wheel and then get more brushes. Um, and then it'll take you to a page where you can download them. And there's like dry media brushes, like watercolor brushes, comic brushes. Like that's a good way to try like a million different brushes and see what you like personally. Yeah, there's so many brushes in those brush packs. It would definitely keep uh, keep all of you very busy for a long time. <laughs> he's he's made so many. Mm -hmm. Yeah, super cool. Yeah, I think I I used to actually for the longest time. I don't know how many years, but it was a lot. Only use the hard round brush, uh, hard and soft round. That was like, I know something I was people associated with me was I never used <laughs> texture brushes. I don't know when I got into using it, you know, quite a few years back, but mm -hmm. now, now I only use a few brushes, but they all kind of have like a purpose. I'm kind of strange because I don't actually create my own brushes. I've, I've never really had a situation where I'm like, I need a brush that does this, mm -hmm. but I'll use brushes and I'll be like, oh, I really like how it does this. And it's like, I almost have to use it first to see if it, it feels right. But now I have brushes that are like kind of associated with different styles of painting. I guess it would be, or different phases of the painting. Like this is what I use in the beginning to block it out. This is mm -hmm. what I use in the middle to kind of carve in shapes that are a little bit smaller. And then this is like my finisher texture one. So that's kind of where I'm at now. That's awesome. That sounds really efficient. Yeah, I think since I paint a lot of the same stuff, since it's usually characters, mm -hmm. but I'm sure if I got more heavily into environments, I would certainly be incorporating more textured brushes in and like foliage yeah. brushes and stuff like that. I've actually already done that a bit. There's um, a brush pack I, I use occasionally if I'm dabbling more in environments. Yeah, I do think it's good. I, I think that experience you have with doing like round brush uh, and hard round brush and soft brush, I, I do think it's really good experience. And I think people that are starting out in digital painting should probably try to keep the brushes slightly simple, at least at the at least at the beginning. Um, 
there's nothing wrong with playing with textured brushes and using them. Like I, I'm, I'm like, I was such a, <laughs> you guys know me, I love brushes. So I'd never tell someone not to do it, but I, I do think that it's easier to work on like fundamental things and the basics when you're not like too distracted with all the fancy stuff and you're kind of like keeping it simple at the start. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, at the end of the day, it's really just about like edge control and, and kind of knowing what shape shapes you want to make. So mm -hmm. yeah, I think you can do that. You know, you can do that theoretically with any brush. It's just once you get knowing like what aesthetic you want, um, then texture brushes can kind of come into play. Yeah. I'm trying to remember this artist I follow on Instagram, but maybe I'm not going to find him. But he, he would do a lot of studies and images and he kept um, labeling it like hard round brush study. And he would just do all these really cool paintings fairly loosely but with uh just the hard round so that's Fortun cool fortunately i can't remember his name but it just kind of <laughs> shows like you know that's really all you need it just comes down to like is that the aesthetic you like mm -hmm. extra brushes definitely give it a cooler look but the fundamentals you can all just do with a you know basic brush yeah basic brush i really like the combination of having yeah hard round brush soft airbrush and then like a smudge brush to be able to kind of like soften some of the the edges in specific places like I'll show real quick um up here if I make a one thing that I like to do a lot is use the lasso tool I guess I haven't really done it much in this particular scene um, but I like to use the lasso tool I'm going to turn off this layer so you can see more clearly um, but I like to use it as like a sort of like a stencil, like I'll um, block off an area. So I select the inverse and oops. Yeah, there we go. So I'll, I'll want to make a specific shape and I'll use the lasso tool to kind of like make a stencil and use the airbrush. So when you deselect, you have like a really interesting shape here where it's like such a hard edge over here and then soft over here. And I, I would do this a lot in shading um, and then you can kind of use the smudge brush to kind of softly smudge away some things. So like for portraits and things like that, sometimes you have those situations where like, you know, a hard edge of a cheek then like fades to a soft um, transition. So it's nice to have like, you know, either the hard um, brush or use a lasso tool to kind of like make that hard edge. And then like the smudge and the soft, yeah. Like you said, you can do, like there's so much variety of edges that you can get just from those very simple tools. It, it's already a lot <laughs> to work with. Yeah, that's it's cool to see you do that. Um, I do the same thing, but I do it with uh, my the first brush I use for blocking in. It's just a hard opaque brush. So I'll make a brush stroke with that and then I'll smudge it with the smudge tool. So I'll keep one edge hard and then I'll smudge yes. the other edge. So same effect, just a different approach. Exactly. And there's also a brush I used to use that had one hard edge and one soft edge. So a lot of different ways to uh, to do that, but now I'll just do a lot of hard, hard brush strokes, opaque, and then just smudge the edges that I want to blend. I think that hard um, edge, soft edge brush. I've seen a few brushes like that. I've tried it, and I I find it a little tricky yeah. to use. Um, it's a great idea, but <laughs> I never got it, got good at it. Because it's like one, or the one I have at least, it's one direction. The hard edge will be on top, and stroke yeah. the other direction will be on the bottom, and I guess if you use it a bit, you you get that muscle memory, but mm -hmm. I like just being able to go in after with a smudge and smudge exactly yeah. what I want. Let's look in black and white. Oh, that's nice. I think it's working better now, value wise. Yeah, and you still, like you were saying, you're not really getting that super stormy look. So I think that's a nice balance. Okay, awesome. I'm going to move her up maybe a little bit higher so she's more standing right at the top or nearer to the top. I'm trying to think about the area that, that's right behind her. I don't want to make anything like too much contrast there because um, I want her the shape of her to be easy to see. So I want to keep it pretty light. But I also don't want to have that awkward thing where it looks like the clouds just avoiding her there. <laughs> so maybe I'll um, add some little tufts getting a little bit closer. 
also um robert i think was asking about the artist i was talking about uh, marco bucci no it was i forget his name i i want to say it starts with like part of his name is y-i-n or x-i-n but i would have to look a little more can't quite remember and then uh bruce asks if i make my own brushes i do not no, I I think I've made like one or two before, but usually I just find a brush that feels like it performs in a way that's co or congruent with how I paint, like my approach, and then mm -hmm. I just stick with it. But I don't know. You would think with for someone who paints every day, I would have a very um, fine tuned understanding of what tools do I like and why do I like them and what do I require them to do to be able to use them. But I've never quite had that. <laughs> But it's just, it, it's it just inside, right? It's like, you just know if you like something or not, that, you yeah. know, you don't necessarily have to know exactly why. It's just, you feel it, you know? Yeah, it's just like, this one feels right and performs right with the approach that I'm trying to do. So I like it. Yeah, that's all you need. Yeah, I mean, I, I've made a couple to kind of experiment and it can be fun, but it's not, a, I'm not one of the people who makes a lot of their own brushes and I use a lot of other people's brushes, I guess. Yeah, I only got into making brushes like a couple years ago and, you know, I've been paint digital painting a while before that and I always just like trying new brushes, downloading brush packs and um, yeah, doing basically I think doing the same way that you did and, and then it was only like some specific things that got me inspired to start making them but yeah, that's definitely not necessary. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. Um, I probably would use a lot more if I did uh, environments but uh, I do remember looking at an artist that I really like and trying to kind of emulate their texture a little bit, their brush strokes a little bit. And I think that is when it's like, okay, well, the brush I have isn't quite making those marks. I bet if exactly. I did this to it, I could. So I think if I was really trying to push that more, I could see myself getting into it. Like this isn't the finished texture I want and how do I make that happen? That's where it starts is like when you start modifying brushes that you have, you know, and I, I advise anyone to do this, like take any brush that you have, have this palette open. So like if you have your brush here, you can just click this little folder icon and brings up the brush settings and just like play with these settings, just turn stuff on and off and see what it does. That's basically just how I learned to make brushes and modify brushes and stuff was just going here and trying things and seeing what happened. And yeah, you can always just go back and reselect the brush and it's gone back to its settings. Don't worry about messing anything up. You can't, you can't do that, you know? So you just, if you, if let's say you do something you like, um, so you change some settings that you like, what you wanna do is go to the top right and then um, click this, these lines here and then click new brush preset. And then you wanna save that out, um, save, type something and save it. Um, because if you don't do that, it's not gonna automatically save your new settings. You, If you go to a different brush and then go back, it, it's gonna be back to its original settings. So yeah, but definitely play with this. It's really, I think it's really helpful because sometimes I'll be using a brush like this flat brush um, and I'll just go here to the brush tip shape. I like to have this open and I'll just like turn the angle of the brush. And there's a reason I, I like to turn it this way rather than putting my brush settings onto like tilt or something. Um, and that's because I do like the, the calligraphy kind of aspect where it gets thin and thick. And if you go to tilt, you'll just get one or the other. I'm getting really detailed here, but my point is I like to have this open and I'm constantly changing little things with my brush settings, even with a brush that I like. Um, I'll, I'll sometimes just go in here and quickly turn something on or off just for like a slightly different effect. Yeah, I actually did something kind of recently now that I think about it, where I think I was trying to emulate that artist and I felt like a lot of their, if they have like a flat colored area, it would have little variations of like the value or the hue would be shifting ever so slightly. So it would just give it a nice texture, even though it's all mm -hmm. kind of one color. So I was playing around with like color dynamics and, you know, trying to mess around with that. So I think it's yeah. good if you know what you want and you're trying to get it, you can just kind of go through and play with those settings and see how they uh how each one changes it a little bit mm -hmm. color <laughs> dynamics is really fun <laughs> yeah definitely also steve says yeah kyle t has over two thousand brushes he has what you need whoa i didn't realize the stats on that that's amazing yeah there's there's certainly a lot and i'm sure you're gonna find stuff you like Annika's given us a reminder that there's a little over 10 minutes left with us. Uh, so yeah, if you guys have any last minute questions or anything you want to ask, definitely put it in chat. We'll check it out. 
Oliver says, wow, two hours has gone so fast. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. We're already 10 minutes to the end of the stream. Flies That by. is wild. This has been a lot of fun. I love seeing this come together from really quick sketch to uh, now we got all these textures going on, a lot of definition. Thank you. I've really enjoyed it. And I feel like it's in a good um, place. I was really hoping that, uh, yeah, this stream would get it to, to a good place where I feel like um, in the next stream, we can do like the sort of finishing effects and um, detailing and things like that. But I do, I do try to sort of break up like this a little bit when I'm um, painting for myself. I, like I, I try to think about almost having like checkpoints a little bit with my work. Like um, when I'll sit down to work on something, um, I'll think about like what I want to get done. And if I, you know, okay, I'm just gonna, tonight I'm just gonna like block things in. If I have a project that I know is gonna be longer, you know, I'm gonna block things in or I'm just gonna work on composition. And then the next time, you know, I'll work on, yeah, texturing, shading, whatever, whatever it might be. Are there any like things that you leave to the very end? Like I know a lot of people will leave like highlights or something to the end. Is there any kind of finishing touches you always do before you call a piece completely done? Yeah, the um, the highlights are definitely a thing although with a scene like this not as much as like with a portrait or something with a portrait i feel like there's always a little shine in the eye or whatever that's coming at the end um but with a scene like this um i just feel like for the values to be working throughout the painting process i do kind of have to put in the highlights um a little bit sooner than the very very end but um there are more like finishing effects that I do. Like um, I use the adjustment layers and I'll do like, um, I'll go down here and choose like selective color. I just go through, I have like sort of a ritual at the end where I go through different adjustment layers just to like see if I can improve things. You know, sometimes um, you can push something a little bit further or fix something if you're like kind of not happy with how something's going. And I, I will use those throughout the process too, if I feel like, oh, I, I, I need to fix something, but definitely at the end. So that's really my my last thing that I do is adjustment layers. Yeah, I'd say that's pretty similar for me too. Of course, like if I'm drawing a character, a lot of times, or especially a portrait, the last thing is those eye highlights. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, adjustment layers just to, oftentimes I'll use like levels to mess with the contrast or you know, play with colors. Exactly. I think that's a pretty common workflow to kind of call it done. Yeah, I think so too. Sometimes I will um, use those also. Um, so what I usually do is I get the painting to a certain point and then normally I do merge everything together at some point, like close to the end. So I'll, uh, and then um, I like to kind of paint all on one layer just for a little bit. And sometimes after I merge everything, I do mess with adjust adjustment layers a little bit at that stage too. <laughs> Pablo says the cloud is the protagonist in this picture. <laughs> <laughs> Star of the show. Yeah, I think so too. We were just doing cloud studies, um, I think last week on my stream. So that came in handy. Oh, perfect. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like I'm definitely gonna have to paint some clouds after this. I feel like I'm missing out. Do it, do it. It's quite relaxing, actually. Yeah. I really like the whole hierarchy of shapes you have. Like the, the top part of the cloud is this really large shape. The one on the middle left-hand side now is like kind of the secondary large and they get smaller towards the bottom. That's a nice feel to it. Thank you. <laughs> Fatima says, today I lost my sleep after seeing you both in stream. I'm wondering, uh, Fatima staying up late to watch this. Aww. <laughs> Appreciate y'all joining us. I know, yeah, I know there's a lot of viewers in the Behance, um, in the Behance streams that are, you know, this is a much later hour for them. That's right. Yeah, thanks for being here, you guys.
All right, we're getting down to the last couple minutes. It's just a heads up. Pain strokes intensify. <laughs> 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 Yeah, this was a lot of fun. I'm definitely looking forward to uh, getting some more detail. We will actually zoom in as well um, tomorrow. So <laughs> I look forward to that. Oh, Beef says it's uh, 6 a.m. So very, very early for you. All right, well, I think this is probably a good place to call it. Um, Maddie, first off, I just wanna say thanks so much for joining us today. This was super fun. Uh, I really enjoyed watching you paint this. For anyone who wants to follow you off stream on your own Behance, anything like that, where can they find you? Okay, um, well, just using my name, you can find me um, at Maddie Belwar on Instagram and Twitter. And then um, here on Behance, uh, behance.net slash Maddie, you can find me there. And you said we're going to be working on more of this tomorrow? Yes, we're going to be um, finishing up details, all the finishing effects that we talked about, drawing um, the foreground elements and just like polishing things up. Awesome. Well, come by tomorrow to see more of this. Everyone, thanks so much for joining us. Really appreciate you being here. And Maddie.